Welcome to the last option available. This is a brand new channel on YouTube where we're going to explore the choices that people do when they have no option available to them. Today we're going to look at one of the biggest last options available, nuclear weapons. And specifically, how do we double the damage from an explosion? Well, let's start off with a little bit of terminology. Because while we all know nuclear weapons, not a lot of us know about the deployment of nuclear weapons. Well, there are two main types of nuclear detonation, ground burst and air burst. The ground burst occurs whenever you have a fireball from the explosion that touches the ground. This contrasts with an air burst where the fireball stops shy of the ground. Now let's refine these definitions a little bit more. We can split up ground burst into a ground burst and a contact surface burst, where the ground burst is a detonation that occurs above the ground but the contact surface burst is whenever the detonation is actually physically in contact with the ground. A great example of this is if you have a contact detonator. Like a typical bomb that you'd see coming out of a World War II bomber, it doesn't actually go off until it hits the ground. But as we separated ground burst into two, let's separate air burst into two different types of detonations also. We have low altitude air burst and high altitude air burst. The low altitude air burst has the purpose of damaging ground targets. They're purposely having the shockwave go and touch the ground. Whereas a high altitude air burst, the shockwave doesn't actually touch the ground or we don't really care about it. We care about blanketing an area of land or space with an EMP or some other force that we're going to destroy orbital assets or MIRVs on re-entry. Now, something that's interesting here is, why do we actually want to split hairs? Because we already have the definition of ground burst and air burst, why do we actually want to get us more detailed? And let's see what happens whenever we have a contact surface burst. With a contact surface burst, you can see that when the explosion goes off, a shockwave is emitted. And the shockwave spreads from the center where the bomb actually went off, and it's going to travel across the ground. However, when we look at a ground burst, or even a low altitude ground burst, you can have a shock wave that once it hits the ground, it is subsequently reflected, and it's reflected back to the sky. And this is creating a secondary shock wave that follows the primary one. Let's call this the reflected shock wave. Once the fireball actually dies down, and this can be just a few seconds, or it can even be much longer, it depends on the size of the bomb. This primary shock wave is traveling around 1150 feet per second, or just above the speed of sound at sea level. But is that it? We just having this single shock wave travel across the ground causing all this damage? Well, let's zoom in on the leading edge of this blast. When we zoom in on the leading edge of this blast, we can see that the primary and reflective shock waves are formed. But the problem we have here is the simulation from Blender is not that accurate at all. And that's because we're having a lot more effects occurring here than just meets the eye in this simple simulation. And the biggest one is what's called the mock stem. The mock stem occurs because the speed of sound is not constant. It changes, and it changes a lot. It can change with altitude or temperature. The higher the altitude, the lower the mock speed. One of the reasons why we have planes traveling at very, very high altitudes at Mach is because we have a lower density and it causes lower heating, it has lower resistance. Also, the Mach speed is a lot lower at that altitude. And you can also have another effect where the Mach speed is influenced by the temperature of the air. The higher the temperature of air, the higher the Mach speed. And wouldn't you know it, that the temperature of air is really hot when it comes from a bomb, especially a nuclear bomb. So a nuclear bomb can easily reach 100 million degrees Celsius. For comparison, our sun is roughly a quarter of that. While this initiation of the bomb is hundreds of degrees of Celsius, we actually have the surface of the fireball. The part that we visibly see is a lot cooler and it's typically peaking around 10,000 degrees Celsius or 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But beyond the fireball, the temperature is still not ambient, and this is due to several factors. One of the things that we have happening here is the, the air is being heated 
due to the rapid compression of the leading shock wave. This leading shock wave is causing a compression and due to Charles's law, that compression rapidly increases the temperature of the air. And also there's the whole fact that a nuclear bomb was just detonated within spitting distance of this leading shock wave. So you're having a lot of different energies going into the air. But setting all of that aside, we have the combination of a higher pressure and higher temperatures. So the reflective shock wave is actually traveling a lot faster than the leading shock wave. This causes the reflected shock wave to catch up and merge with the primary shock wave. This effect where you have the secondary shock wave merge with the primary shock wave is called the mock stem. And this mock stem causes a lot more damage. Specifically, it causes a pressure wave to be twice as strong. And that's enough to take a 1 psi shock wave, which is enough to break your typical windows in a house and transform it into one that will knock down your walls in your house. Well, in a traditional usage of a nuclear bomb, you may not think that this has too much bearing on its deployment. Let's think about it. You're only going from breaking glass to knocking down a wall or two. Well, if we're doing this beyond just looking at we can double the amount of damage, you're actually having a second effect occur. If you care about knocking down walls, you're going to have the shock wave travel a lot longer of a distance, carrying that much energy to knock down your walls. Now, if we look at it, any bomb, it doesn't have to be nuclear, it could be conventional, will have the damage from it decrease by the cube of its distance. That means if you double the distance, you will have to have eight times the size of the bomb to cause the same amount of damage. However, if you just double the pressure wave from the mock stem, you can wind up having your bomb damage go 26% further just because your target is on the ground rather than in the air. This makes dumb bombs and unguided munitions a lot more effective. If we have a one megaton nuclear bomb and it has the mock stem formed, it will cause six PSI damage at two kilometers away or 1.3 miles away from the epicenter of the blast. This is occurring at 4.6 seconds, and that is the exact point that the mock stem will start to form for it. However, whenever we go to 37 seconds from the detonation, we're talking over half a minute here, the mock stem is already 15 kilometers away, or 9.5 miles away, from the epicenter. But its pressure has decreased all the way down to 1 psi, just enough to break glass. Something else that's very interesting about the mock stem, whenever you have the mock stem get further and further away from the center, the mock stem itself is increasing in height. It's causing that double pressure wave higher up in elevation. And this is important because the mock stem is going to become nearly vertical the farther and farther away you're going to get from the epicenter. Also, if you have a target that is, let's say, on a hill or that's elevated in a building, it may not be at that mock stem, the double pressure wave, if it's above the ground. But it may be if it's further away from the epicenter. I won't ask you if you've enjoyed the last option, but if you want to learn more, follow me for the next episode. Subscribe. It means a lot for a completely new channel. If you have any questions about this, send me a comment down below. I'd be happy to talk about this more. Godspeed, and may we never need the last option.